Welcome to the Off the Charts Football Podcast. I'm Matt Manicharian, joined by Mark Simon of Sports Info Solutions. And on today's episode, we're going to diverge from our usual stat inclined discussions and talk about something a little bit more important. Mark Simon, if you don't know him, he is filling in the second chair today, and he fills a variety of roles in R&D for, for SIS. And he's also the head of our Diversity and Inclusion Committee at Sports Info Solutions. Our guest today is Jeremy Duru. Jeremy is a sports law expert, media commentator, law professor, author, and advocate for strength and solutions around diversity and inclusion. He's the author of the 2011 book, Advancing the Ball, Race, Reformation, and the Quest for Equal Coaching Opportunity in the NFL, which examines the NFL's movement towards increased equality of opportunity for coaches and front office personnel. He's also written two other books on sports business. Jeremy, how's it going? It's going well, Matt. Thanks for having me. Before we get too far into things, can you give us a more complete description of who you are and what you do? Before I go to the fundamentals, I'm a father and a husband, and that's, that's, that's probably my core. But when we come to the professional world, I'm a lawyer and a civil rights lawyer who happened upon the intersection of sports and race and law a couple of decades ago. And when I realized that I could explore sport, which I love, uh, together with civil rights, uh, for which I have a, a real passion, I kind of seized upon it, and I've been I've been focusing on those things ever since. You've been at this for for quite a long time. Then you kind of it seems like you've lived a couple of lives already, as far as this goes. Yeah, I've been doing it for a while. I think the great thing about it is I'm not at all tired of it or sick of it. I mean, and like I can see myself doing this, uh, you know, until I retire. Once I retire, I'll probably semi-retired, and I'll keep doing it because I just feel as though. The sport has this extraordinary platform. Everybody watches sport. You know, if IBM or Xerox, you know, gets a new CEO, then a few people on, uh, you know, in the industry will know about it. If the Pittsburgh Steelers get a new head coach, everybody is talking about it. So if we can explore through sport what it takes to um, ensure uh, equity in employment, equal employment opportunity. I think we're doing a lot toward teaching society more generally about how to um, appreciate and embrace diversity and equal opportunity. Right. There are a hundred senators, but there are just 32 head coaches. And most people know who the head coach of their team is. They may or may not know who their senator is. Let's get into current events a little bit. The league went through a, another hiring cycle. And the biggest news, I think, on this front is who didn't get a job. And that's Eric Bieniemy. Everybody's been talking about it. The Chiefs offensive coordinator who has helped build their incredible offense, develop Patrick Mahomes, and still doesn't have a head coaching job. How did you say that the NFL did with regard to both the, the head coach and the GM hirings in this past cycle? Well, I think, you know, the GM hirings um, went reasonably well. Uh, went from two GMs of color up to five GMs of color. Uh, the head coach hirings didn't go uh, as well at all. You know, we're at five uh, head coaches of color. Um, we lost one and added two head coaches of color, one uh, Lebanese head coach uh, and one African-American uh, head coach. And then you, you mentioned the enemy, and it truly is unfortunate. I mean, this guy's been at the helm of one of the all-time great offenses for years now. And, and the individuals who held that role before the enemy under Andy Reid out there in Kansas City um, got head coaching jobs, and yet the enemy has kind of been shut out. So that's a real problem and very unfortunate. Um, and so I, so this hiring season, I don't think, went that well. I, I think that one thing that maybe we'll talk about as we proceed in our conversation, and one thing that I think your listeners should think about in terms of conceptualizing the issue, is I don't know if it does us the best service to think about year-over-year increases and decreases, because I think we'll have something looking like the stock market, you know, up and down on the mm -hmm. line chart. Um, and I think we have to think about long-term systemic efforts and initiatives that are going to get us to a place where we truly have uh, equal opportunity for these positions. I know that you've talked about the issue with representation being one that would be solved at the ownership level. And I know that you've said I heard this uh, on another podcast you did recently that the one of the issues is that is if they, you ask an owner, they won't be able to articulate what they want in a head coach. And I wrote down here, how can this be? Yeah, no, it's often the case. It's often the case. And I think that the problem, Mark, is that I think you often come across 
uh, this this conversation where an owner might say, perhaps in private moments, look, you know, I know who I want to hire for the job. You know, I've been doing this a while. I know who I want to hire. The problem is that's the wrong interrogation. That's the wrong question. The question shouldn't be who do you want to hire. The question should be who is best for the job. And in order for you to answer that question, you have to move away perhaps from who you want to hire. Those two questions often have very different answers. So if you move away from, hey, who do I want to hire? And you start thinking about who would be best for the job. Then I think, Mark, you can zero in on the things you're really looking for to make your team better than it is currently. Do you think that NFL teams are placing a priority on hiring coaches? Obviously, X's and O's get brought up a lot, but the idea of uh, head coaches who connect with their players as people and not just as football players. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that's critical. Um, I think that it's critical to hire a head coach who uh, is a leader. Obviously, you need to have somebody who knows the game of football, and you need to have somebody uh, who understands the X's and O's. But at the end of the day, the head coach has an offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, the special teams coordinator, and the head coach is instead the CEO, the manager. When you've got someone who's managing an operation, the CEO of an operation, you're thinking about leadership, you're thinking about interpersonal communication ability, you're thinking about being able to connect uh, with your employees, and in this case, uh, with your players. So uh, I think those attributes, leadership, ability to connect, I think they're, they're sorely underappreciated when we talk about the head coach searches. One guy who got a lot of consideration for Coach of the Year was uh, Brian Flores in, in Miami. And as you described the, the traits that you'd be looking for, it almost seems to me like you're describing Brian Flores to a T. He's such a great example of all the things that you're saying, that if you look for that coach, those traits, then all of a sudden, you know, it falls right into place. It's not like you have to do some sort of a crazy dance. I did think of a crazy dance that the league kind of did this year, and I wanted to ask you, the, the rule changes this year, the rule changes that rewarded compensatory picks. I'm curious to see if you had an opinion on that rule change and then how it went in, in year one, at least. I know we talked about the, the overall success, but what about specifically as it pertained to that rule? Uh, the rule is an interesting one, quite a novel one in professional sports um, and quite a controversial one. And, you know, my view, when it comes to this issue in the National Football League, when I say this issue, I mean the issue of, of equal opportunity. To, to achieve leadership positions, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of of the view that we have to have everything on the table. We've got to contemplate all possibilities because decades have gone by and there hasn't been the sort of progress that we'd like to see. Uh, and so uh, I, you know, I do not fault the NFL for coming up with this proposal and we'll see how it, we'll see ultimately what sort of impact uh, it has. You know, I will say that there was kind of criticism of it coming from all fronts. I mean, you had the criticism that you might anticipate, uh, ha you know, coming from the right, but, but there was also substantial criticism coming um, from the left and from some of the as assistant coaches in the, in the league who felt like this created a, an odd sort of crutch or perhaps a stigma um, that they, you know, that you got to give someone compensatory picks, you know, just to, you know, to have, to have somebody hired. But like you say, you know, we'll see how it plays out. You know, and I and I don't think we can. I don't think we see how it plays out yet. I think we right, see the stock how it market, plays like out you said, when the drafts come by, mm -hmm. and that's when you start to see outrage. When you start to see fan bases saying, "Well, how come this club gets extra? You know, a couple of third round picks?" And then the rule is discussed again, and then you have you know arguments coming from both sides. Uh, you know, I'll conclude by saying, drastic times call for drastic measures, and I think the league's been dealing with drastic times, and so um, I don't fault them for this aggressive measure. Given that the leagues, uh, that any league in professional sports is a copycat league, what do you think the chances are that an NFL team looks at an, ex an example like Tampa Bay and says, hey, let me get a broad range of people in the room like they did, men, women, different races, different, different everything. Uh, what, do you, what are the chances that you think another team kind of puts forth that kind of coaching room? Yeah. So first of all, let's, let's all just take a couple moments to appreciate that coaching room. I mean, it mm -hmm. truly is extraordinary. You have a person of color, an offensive, defensive, and special team coordinator. You have down the line, you have two women, as you mentioned, one woman of color, Mark. So it truly is an extraordinarily diverse staff, and it won. 
And, you know, it's, it's an anecdotal example of what a lot of sociological studies have suggested over the years, that when you take a diverse group, for, in all different regards, race, mm-hmm. gender, ideological perspective, socioeconomic background, and you get them looking at a problem, you're going to have better success at solving the problem because you have people coming from so many different perspectives. And I think this Tampa Bay staff is a perfect um, illustration uh, of the beauty of that. Now, whether indeed other clubs will copy it, I think it goes back to what we were talking about before, which is, are people asking who they want or are people asking who will be best? And if people are still you know, stuck asking you know, who they want, then we may run into the problem. But if people really want to explore what will give them the greatest competitive advantage, they'd be silly to, to not at least consider what's happened in Tampa Bay and how that sort of dynamic could benefit them. And what about the idea of just giving a coach a long time? Marvin Lewis, Mike Tomlin, multiple coaches get a chance, I guess, to clean up their own mess, so to speak, whether it was created by themselves or whether it was something that just chance that things happen. There aren't a lot of teams that do that these days. Uh, why, why do you think that is? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's unfortunate. I think it goes to impatience. But it goes to something else. You just mentioned Marvin Lewis and Mike Tom. Those two were hired after deeply intensive and deliberate searches using really large pools. The Steelers search, initially, I think they came up with just short of 40 candidates, which they then narrowed to 12, which they then narrowed to four. And Mike Tomlin ended up getting the job. I think when you do that sort of search and you take your time and you're not just knee-jerk reaction, you know, Black Monday comes around at the end of the season and you hire within 10 days. And if you're not taking that sort of approach, you're really taking a deliberate approach. I think you are going to find someone who's going to be better. And consequently, they're going to be in the jobs longer. But also, if you take that sort of approach, I think you yourself will feel like, you know what? I vetted this person. I looked at it from all angles. This season wasn't that great. But there's a reason we went for this person. Let's give him a shot. I think if your knee-jerk reaction and you just grab somebody because you're afraid someone else will grab them and they may be the hot candidate and things go badly for two years, you may not even have confidence in your own process and therefore um, you know, be quicker to jettison the coach and start, and start anew, which, of course, increases – you know, they're, they're decreases stability, increases instability. And how do these uh, search firms that you hear about, the coaching search firms, how do they fit into that? Are they usually helping the process, hurting the process? Hard to say. You know, I, I think the jury's out on that. I think you see the search firms more with uh, front office roles than you do with, with coaching roles. But but search firms have definitely over the, the last, I don't know, five, 10 years, gotten a, a stronger a hold uh, uh, in the industry. I think it all depends on the search firm. You know, I think if you have a good search firm, a search firm that knows the game, it's not just a general executive search firm, but a search firm that knows sports and then that knows the game and a search firm that is attuned to the importance of diversity and the importance of equal opportunity, then I think that potentially, you know, they can, you know, the search firm can add value. I think if you're lacking those things, then the search firm can unfortunately uh, perhaps be an impediment. Right. So it's not search firm or no search firm. It's, it's, is the search firm actually helping doing all the things that you were talking about earlier? So aside from teams waking up and realizing, hey, diversity works, you know, we can be like the Bucks and win games, or we can kind of be meandering about this mark. I feel like this is almost like we talk about analytics all the time on here, Jeremy. And it's like, well, do you want to use analytics and maybe help make you better decisions to help win games? Or do you want to keep arguing about whether or not it's something that we need around here? Man, this conversation sounds familiar. What what are some other solutions that we haven't seen that could be implemented on the NFL level that that would help this sort of a thing? Yeah, so I mean, you know, there one that I've actually pushed for a few years, um, and it's not been something that the NFL has, has taken up, but I'm going to keep pushing for it because I think it's an important one and will be one that bears fruit. Is it goes to this point I made earlier about the deliberative process? I actually think that. Uh, there should be a, a moratorium on head coach hirings between the end of the regular season and the Super Bowl. I think that what you have currently is a mad, as we discussed, a mad scramble 
for uh, the next head coach. And I think that causes all sorts of problems. I think it makes it less likely that you'll get the best person. But I also think it disadvantages candidates of color because when people are forced to make a, a quick response, make a quick selection, a quick decision, um, they tend to retreat into their comfort zone. This isn't just about football. This is a general matter. And unfortunately, um, the comfort zones for most of the NFL brain trusts, the owners of clubs, it tends to be people who are a lot like them or look like them or um, come from backgrounds like them. And that tends to be um, white. And so uh, I think you're less likely to uh, spread your wings and think about someone outside of that uh, comfort zone if you have to make a quick decision. If you've got six weeks and you know nobody else can hire in that period either and so that one hot coach who you really like will still be around six weeks later uh, to interview I think you're more likely to take your time and think broadly and cast a wide net and I think that uh, ultimately will serve as a competitive advantage Um, uh, I think it serves as a competitive advantage for those who do it now but if you did it uh, you know if it was league-wide I think the advantage would be across the league. I think we'd end up with better coaches and better football. Yeah, I'll, I'll sign up for that. I love that. That reminds me of the Malcolm Gladwell book, Blink, about how decisions you know, that happen quickly are, are different than yeah, decisions that you, can, that you can sit yeah. on. And it also reminds me of quarterbacks, right? Quarterback pressures. We talk about how almost every quarterback performs le- worse under pressure than they do with a clean pocket. Let's give these teams a clean pocket and ability to make the best decision. I love it. I haven't thought about that metaphor for her, but I love it. So switching over to baseball, we do a ton of work on the baseball side too. The Yankees recently announced that they have a diversity and inclusion committee, and they're going to start a mentoring program. Tyrone Brooks is a friend of Mark and mine. He heads up MLB's mentoring network um, for, for diverse candidates. Does the NFL have a path of a similar nature or, or, or how, how effective are these sorts of things when they are set up in general? So I think they can be very effective, and I think a lot of it depends on who's <clears throat> who's running it. Um, I've had a few conversations with Tyrone over the years, don't know him well, but I know his work. Um, he's very committed to it, and he does great work. So I think that, you know, it can be very effective, and I think we're seeing that in Major League Baseball. The NFL doesn't have anybody in Tyrone's position. They've got an expanded and built-out um, uh, diversity and inclusion office, but they don't have anybody in Tyrone's position. I think the person who ends up doing that sort of work is Troy Vincent, executive vice president over there at the league. Um, but the problem is Troy Vincent has a whole has a whole other portfolio, being in charge of football operations. And so I think he's pulled pretty thin. And so I do think that the NFL would benefit from from having somebody who is dedicated to that portfolio, as Tyrone is over there with Major League Baseball. How is the NFL doing with diversity and inclusion relative to the other leagues? Well, I can tell you historically, they've struggled, um, which may be one of the reasons we're talking now. They've traditionally been well behind Major League Baseball in terms of the first head coach in the modern era. I think Frank Robinson became a manager in 75, Bill Russell for the Celtics in 66, and of course, we have Art Shell in the modern era, so 1989. And so uh, historically, the NFL has been behind. Currently, I think um, the NBA leads all leagues on this um, and certainly leads the National Football League, um, although they've had some struggles as of late with respect to diversity in, in, uh, in top spots. But I think Major League Baseball may be a little bit ahead of uh, the NFL as well. I think when the NFL came out with the Rooney Rule, they were a real torchbearer. This is almost two decades ago, uh, but I think that other leagues have uh, have caught up. Of course, there are differences in you know, the, the playing population of Major League Baseball is quite different than the playing population of uh, the National Football League. But I would say all the leagues that I've mentioned uh, have room to improve. How is the NFL doing with diversity and inclusion in its other areas, Um, business, analytics, scouting, uh, all these other ways that they can can do, do hiring? So I think there's room to improve in all those areas that you mentioned with particular, you know, with respect to the clubs. There's also room to improve with respect to the other NFL businesses, so NFL Network and NFL Films. They're far less diverse probably than they uh, should be. And and the office down Park Avenue could use diversity as well. I will say that the uh, upper Park Avenue, they've done a good job over the course of the last 10 years in increasing gender diversity, Um, and they should be recognized for that. Um, But I'd say across the league and its properties, 
we could stand to see more diversity. And what does progress look like? So one year from now, five years from now, what, what can realistically be done? So that's a good question. And here's what I think. I don't think that we, I don't think that we can set a number, nor should we, nor should we set a number as to what well, progress means X number of uh, black head coaches or X number of general managers of color. I think that, I think we have achieved progress when you have a person of color who is quite mediocre and gets fired and then gets another job. That happens rarely for candidates of color, much more frequently for candidates uh, who are white. And so when you have that second opportunity, notwithstanding relatively unimpressive first tenure, that's, I think, where we're getting to a point where we're really seeing equal opportunity across the board. Uh, we should note, of course, that this is Black History Month. Football fans sometimes hear the name Fritz Pollard, but I'm guessing that many don't know who he is. Can you help educate our listeners on Fritz Pollard? Sure. So when, we were, when, I, met, when I talked about uh, head coaches in the modern era, and I mentioned Art Shell, I, I specifically use the term modern era. And the reason I use the term modern era is because Art Shell, although he's the first black uh, head coach in the modern era of the NFL, he's not the first black head coach in the NFL. Back in 1921, a gentleman named Fritz Pollard, who was also a player, he was a player coach, became the first black coach in the National uh, Football League. He played in the league, he was an outstanding player. He coached in the league, he was an outstanding coach, and he got kicked out of the league. Uh, when the league's owners, led by George Hallis out there in, in, uh, in Chicago and Preston Marshall in D.C., led the owners to uh, a gentleman's, a quote-unquote gentleman's agreement that kicked out all the people of color from the league. All the black people were expurgated. And so notwithstanding all that he'd done, uh, he was kicked out. Uh, he had a great business career after that. Um, he started a black football league, um, but it wasn't until 1946 that black people were brought back into the league and Fritz Pollard was essentially forgotten, left off the pages of history until the turn of the century when he became uh, rediscovered and ultimately became uh, a member of the uh, Hall of Fame. And of course, the Fritz Pollard Alliance uh, in his namesake. Absolutely. And indeed, I should point out that the Fritz Pollard Alliance took his name uh, in 2003 and that kind of uh, re- you know, resurrected the nation's imagination with respect to him, and people learned more about him. I think the Fritz Pollard Alliance taking that name helped to push him toward Canton. Well, if you're looking for some good reading, I definitely recommend reading up on Fritz Pollard because that was just a little taste of the history there. Lastly, uh, before we get out of here, is there anything football fans can do to, to aid the cause related to better representation in the NFL? What, what can the people do? You know, people can do a lot. I and mean, one thing we've learned, history has taught us in this country and elsewhere, is that the people can do a lot if the people uh, are vocal. And so, I mean, if, if people have a concern about this, then it's important that they express it. They express it to the clubs they follow. They express it to the league. They express it in social media. You know, we're in a world now where everybody has a microphone. You know, 30 years ago, it was hard to grab that microphone. Everybody's got a microphone now. There's so many outlets for you to express your opinion. Um, and if people seize upon those and organize um, and, 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 and talk with their feet, that is to say, if they're dissatisfied, perhaps they reduce the extent to which they patronize an entity or an organization, uh, then folks start to listen. Uh, so that's what I'd suggest. And particularly with respect to sponsors of leagues, of clubs, you make your view known to them and you've got a strong enough coalition sponsor who is now under pressure from the people will make the view known to the organization. Is there anything that you're working on um, specific to this? I mean, are there any projects that you're specifically working on now or in the future? Yeah. So, and and I should also point out that if, uh, you know, folks want to continue this conversation, they can reach out to me on Twitter. Yeah. And I'm pretty much always working on, uh, on this stuff. So right now I'm actually working on a sports law, writing a sports law treatise with a colleague of mine. It has a big portion dedicated to the concept of oh, the intersection of race and sports and law. Um, and as you point out, you know, I'm frequently speaking about it, it's, uh, uh, involved in workshops and uh, on panels with respect to this, uh, this issue. Because as I said from the very beginning, it's important to me. I think it's important to society. And I feel privileged to be able to work in this area. This is awesome stuff. Thank you so much for joining us, Jeremy. We've uh, absolutely uh, been lucky to have you on. 
It was a pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. The 2021 SIS Football Rookie Handbook is coming soon, featuring scouting reports on more than 250 players entering the NFL in 2021. The handbook is a must-read for football fans. The book is written as if you, the reader, are one of the team's decision-makers. We capture every strength and weakness both through scouting and statistical analysis, and we've got the most detailed injury information in the scouting industry. The handbook also features essays on important football topics and provides an in-depth take from the perspective of every position on the field. New this year, it will be available on Kindle. To order the Football Rookie Handbook, go to www.actasports.com or wherever books are sold. Thank you to all of our listeners. You might have noticed Aaron wasn't with us today. He won't be joining us as a weekly co-host anymore, but he will be back as a guest from time to time. So if you still want more of Aaron, you'll be able to find him here sporadically going forward. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. We're at sportsinfo underscore SIS. And you can find Jeremy Duru at N Jeremy Duru. That's N-J-E-R-E-M-I-D-U-R-U. The Football Rookie Handbook is out to the printer right now. You can order your copy at actasports.com. That's A-C-T-A sports.com. And we'll be back next week to preview the book for you. For my co-host, Mark Simon, and our producer, Justin Stein, I'm Matt Manicharian, and thank you for joining us for the latest episode of the Off the Charts Football Podcast. Podcast.